This is a video about the second form of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And before we get to that, I need to tell you about what an indefinite integral is with a particular base point. So let's start with that. So if you've got a Riemann integrable function, little f, that's Riemann integrable on this integral from a to b, then I'm going to define for you a new function. Let me get a different color highlighter here. Let's do that one. Uh, the new function I'm going to talk about is capital F, and the input of capital F is Z. That's the independent variable, and so how is capital F defined? Well, it is some kind of an integral of little f, and it's the integral from A to that Z. So again, what's the variable here? The variable is this uh, uh, top limit of integration Z, and that should be a function that's defined for all Z between A and B. So what we're going to call this function capital F is the indefinite integral of little f with base point A. And so the base point is just whatever the lower, lower limit of integration is. Let me try to give you a picture of how you should think about capital F. And let's assume that uh, I give you a graph and here's F. Here's the graph of F from A to B. Of course, it's a function that's above the x-axis in this case. It doesn't have to be. Just for my picture, it makes it look nice. Let's say I've got some point Z between A and B. Then what is capital F? Capital F is going to be the shaded area there. So think of it again as it's just trying to say take the definite integral of your function from A to Z and whatever that area is, is capital F of Z here. So you think about as Z moves closer and closer to B, uh, in that case we're just getting more and more area. So this function is increasing, maybe you notice that. So what we're going to try to do is, is say as much as we can about this function capital F. So, well, the first thing that we can say about it is the indefinite integral. When I say that, think of that function capital F up there. So when I say as above, again, capital F. Uh, so this thing here, the indefinite integral of my function F is continuous on AB. Further or moreover, or in fact, if F, so first of all, wait a minute, little f is Riemann integrable, therefore it's got to be bounded on AB. So it makes sense to say that F is bounded above and below by some number, say M. Um, I guess absolute values bounded above and below by m. Uh, for all x in my interval, then what can I say? I can say that the difference in the outputs of capital F should be less than or equal to m uh, times uh, the, uh, the length between z and w. So maybe this looks familiar a little bit as well. This is trying to say that capital F satisfies a Lipschitz condition on this interval from a to b. And so this should hold for all z to w and a to b. So what was that? What was the thing about Lipschitz functions? That was back uh, when we talked about uniform continuity. And what we showed then is being a Lipschitz function is pretty strong. That implies it's continuous. So what we're actually going to do is we're really just going to show this part here that it satisfies this Lipschitz condition uh, whenever I've got a bound for capital F. Uh, and again, what I'm saying to you is if it satisfies that Lipschitz condition, then your function's continuous. So we'll have that too. So what's the proof of this look like? Uh, so let z and w be two points that are in your interval from a to b, and let's say that w is less than or equal to z. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the additivity theorem of the integral. That tells me that capital F of z, which of course is the integral from a to z of little f, that should be equal to, I should be able to split it into two pieces. Remember, w is a point between a and z, right? So I should be able to split this integral from a all the way to z to, I'll just go a to w first, and then plus the integral from w to z, kind of the rest of the way. And now what I want to do is I want to realize that this, uh, sorry, I meant to say this integral here, that's just capital F of w. And then I've still got, just copy paste this one here. So now what I'm going to do is manipulate a little bit. I'm just going to subtract this one all the way back over here, and that's this line right here. So the difference between f of z and f of w is equal to the integral, what would I have left? Well, I'd have this integral left when I move f, capital F of w over. Uh, so sorry, this difference between f of z and f of w is equal to the integral from z, w to z of f. Great. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to show when we take absolute value that this is less than something. So let's get there. So by hypothesis, remember, uh, f of x is between minus m and m for all x in my interval from a to b. And so what can we say more over then? Well, that tells me when I integrate, I've also got upper and lower bounds for the integral of f. I know that a good lower bound for the integral of f from w to z should be equal to, well, that bound on f 
times the length of the interval from w to z, which is z minus w. And a good upper bound for the integral of f should be equal to the rectangle, again, whose height is m, if you want to think of it that way, and whose base is z minus w. Again, the length of the interval that I'm integrating over. So that always helps me. I'm thinking about these, or what are some massive rectangles that I know would be good upper and lower bounds for if I want to think about this as an area uh, in the right way. And so what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this a little bit. I see that I've got uh, just opposites of each other on this side. I'm going to rewrite this uh, a couple different ways. I guess I'm not quite there yet, so ignore my comment I just made. <laughs> so what do I want to do first? I'm going to do my little substitution. I know that this integral here is the same thing as the difference between capital F of Z and capital F of W. So I'll just substitute that in. Okay, and then now is where I want to treat this. I want to take this compound inequality and I want to return it to being a good um, college algebra type of uh, absolute value inequality. So that says the absolute value in the middle should be less than or equal to m, remember m's positive, times the absolute value of z minus w. And why is that cool? That is that Lipschitz condition. So that shows that f is Lipschitz on this interval from a to b, and finally, remember that implies that f is continuous on a to b. And remember, even on a closed bounded interval, that's this continuous is the same thing as uniformly continuous. So capital F is a pretty nice function in this case. Now we're ready. We're ready for the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So if f is a Riemann integrable function that's continuous just somewhere in your interval, just at some c, then the indefinite integral is differentiable at c, and in fact, the formula for the derivative of the indefinite integral at c should just be little f evaluated at c. That's pretty cool. So to think about, we just showed that capital F's pretty nice, it's Lipschitz, and now we're showing it's, it's even more nice. It's differentiable at some point where it's continuous at, where the little function, little f's continuous. So what would the proof of this look like? And then we'll do some examples using it. So first thing is we're going to think about the derivative in a slightly different way. Uh, if, if I've got a function g, I'm going to think of its derivative at c as being the limit as h goes to 0 of this here. And so uh, you should think about that this is the same thing as the difference quotient that I've been playing with before that looks more like maybe the slope formula from college algebra. Uh, this is much more aligned with what in college algebra you'd probably actually call the difference quotient. So we're going to use this definition of the derivative in this proof here. And of course, this happens whenever that limit exists. So let's suppose first that uh, C is between A and B, but I don't want it to be B. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna show that the limit as H goes to zero of my difference quotient, uh, which is again, this here, but again, I'm coming uh, from the right. So C is a point in here, so I'll come from the right that this exists and it equals f of c. And the proof for the left-hand limit, if c is a point that's not a, but could be uh, any point between a and b besides a, the proof for that is similar. And then I would have them both. I would have both the left and the right-hand limits, and then we'd be done. So we're just going to do the right-hand one, again, assuming that c is strictly to the left of b uh, in this case. So how would this go? What are we going to do? Again, I want to show that this is equal to f of c. What I'm going to do is use this limit definition to try to show that they're within epsilon of each other, that this difference quotient here is within epsilon of f of c. So let's fix epsilon be bigger than zero. And now let's think about what have I got to play around with? Well, I know that uh, f, little f, is continuous at this point c. So that'll get me uh, some ground to work with to play with this epsilon a little bit. So since f's continuous at c, there exists, I used eta here. You probably think delta if you've been watching the continuity videos, the same thing. So if x is between c and c plus eta, and eta sub epsilon, I'll probably just call it eta, then I should be able to say that the outputs are within epsilon of each other. And what I'll do is I'll untwist that absolute value inequality a little bit as f of x minus f of c is between minus epsilon and epsilon. And finally, what I'll do is I'll add f of c everywhere. So that tells me that f of c plus epsilon, I'm sorry, that should be a minus there. What am I doing? f of c minus epsilon is less than f of x, which is now less than uh, f of c plus epsilon. All right, so f of x is between these two constants. Cool. All right, so now what are we going to do? We're going to let h be some number that is between 0 and this number eta that's uh, helped me with the definition of continuity. So since f's Riemann integrable on a to b, uh, I can use the additivity theorem again, and it ensures that f is integrable on these subintervals a to c, a to c plus h, and c to c plus h. Again, since f is integrable on this whole interval from a to b, it should be integrable on all the subintervals as well. 
or, or on any subintervals as well, is what I should say. And now, maybe why did I pick these ones? Well, because they're going to be related to each other via the additivity theorem, where the integral from a all the way from a to c, plus the integral from c to a little bit more, ought to be equal to the integral from a all the way to c plus h. So you see that I've kind of broken this big integral into these two sort of intermediate ones. And uh, why did we do that? Well, because this is capital F of C, and this is capital F of C plus H. So what we'll do is we'll rewrite that now. So again, I just made that substitution in this line. And uh, the last thing that I'll do, which is I will just move this, I'll subtract it over to this side. And the way that I'm gonna write that though, I'm gonna write it this way. So again, subtract this over, that's this minus that is equal to this integral from c to a little bit past c of little f here. Now, we're gonna kinda of keep this in our back pocket, I think, and we're gonna start playing around with this sum now. So if x is a number that's between c and c plus h, then what else do I know? Well then, x is also satisfies this condition. C, it's between c and c plus eta, and so that tells me that uh, the output of x should still satisfy this inequality up here. So it still satisfies that definition of continuity up there. Right? I guess I, I should say f of x satisfies these inequalities up here by the continuity of f is what I mean to say. So what we'll do now is we'll apply it to this integral here. What can I say about this integral from c to c plus h? And it's the same kind of idea here. I should have, well, this integral, uh, a good lower bound for it would be whatever this height is times this base. And so that's the length of the base from c to c plus h. Think about that as length h. And a good um, upper bound for this integral would be what's the tallest that f of x could be for x is in this interval. Well, that would be this by my inequalities above from the continuity argument. Uh, again, times the length of the base, which again, c to c plus h. And so why is this kind of cool? Well, we are going to rewrite this now. That's this here. Well, we just showed above. That's equal to the difference of capital F of c plus h minus capital F of c. So I'll just make that substitution right here. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide everything by h. And note that h is a positive number. Remember, I assumed that h was in 0 to my, my small number eta. So when I divide by h, I get to retain all these good inequalities. They all face the same way. And maybe you see why this is cool. Now I could subtract f of c everywhere. That'll just put a minus f of c in the middle. And I get that these two numbers are within epsilon of each other. The difference quotient is within epsilon of f of c. Cool. And so what does that show? Well, epsilon is arbitrary. That is the same thing as saying that the limit as h goes to zero from the right of this difference quotient has to be f of c. So we've shown what the derivative is. Now, uh, let's say a little bit more. Remember the fundamental theorem, how it's stated, the second form above, how it was stated, I just assumed the function was continuous at some point c. Uh, what if your function little f is continuous at all points in the interval? Well, then the indefinite integral capital F is in fact differentiable at all points in the integral, in the interval from a to b. And you can say the derivative of capital F is equal to little f for all x in the interval. Um, and so what does that say? That says if the little function little f is continuous on the whole interval, then the indefinite integral is a good antiderivative of f. And there's a little bit of subtlety. The indefinite integral is not necessarily an antiderivative of f whenever f's not continuous on the whole interval. So you can think of an example with that. It has to do with uh, maybe the sine function and absolute value if you want to look into that a little bit further. The last thing I want to do for this video is just to show you um, what's some of the power or how is uh, this fundamental theorem of calculus typically used and how is this formula typically used. And so again, what it does is it tells me how do I find the derivative of something like this, of the integral from zero to z of e to the minus x squared dx, where again though, when I say find the derivative, I mean with respect to z, the input of capital F. So here, what are some things to notice? Well, the function little f here is e to the minus x squared, and that's a fantastic function. It's continuous for all real numbers. So what I'm trying to say then as well is that, well, if this thing's continuous for all real numbers, then this indefinite integral has to be differentiable for all real numbers by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And moreover, the fundamental theorem of calculus at the end told me that the formula for f prime should just be little f of z. So a little bit anticlimactic, it should just be my function here with the top endpoint plugged in. So e to the minus c squared. And that's the answer. So the derivative of this thing is just e to the minus c squared. Let's do another one. 
So let's say g of z is equal to this integral from zero to sine of z, now it's gonna be neat, of x squared dx. So let's try to uh, tackle it the same way. So what's the function you're integrating? That's little f and it's x squared. And again, it's a cool function. It's continuous for all real numbers. And now let's bring in this kind of intermediate function. Notice I, I'm just trying to match, it starts at zero, that's the base point. I really don't really do anything with that uh, afterwards. So uh, if you're wondering how come he's not doing anything with that, we don't really need it right now for the fundamental theorem. Um, so if I define capital F to be, maybe uh, this is a little bit more usual, we're used to from above in the beginning of the video, I wanna notice how does this relate to this function g? So what I'm trying to be careful of is, I don't know if, I don't quite know how to differentiate this yet. I want to show you how to do it. And so how is this related to this? Well, it looks like I just plugged in sine of z to f, and that's how you get g. So in particular, what I want you to notice is that capital G is the composition of big F and sine of z. And why did I want to point that out? What am I going for? Well, I want to differentiate g but that's the composition of these two. How do you differentiate the composition of two functions? You need the chain rule to do that. So that should be f prime of sine of z times the derivative of the inside. So again, thinking about this function as the composition of these two tells me how to differentiate the right way. So you're using the chain rule. Now, what is this? That should be just little f of, sorry, that should say, uh, little f of sine of z. And that's by the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's by the theorem that we just proved. And of course, the derivative of this should just be cosine. And so what do we get then? So this should be again sine of z here. That's why, what does little f do? Well, little f just squares stuff. So that should just be sine of z quantity squared times cosine of z. So this would be the derivative of this nasty looking indefinite integral.